Welcome to the 20th topic in my course when I'm looking at networks. And this video and the next video, which is on the internet, are two enormous topics, a load of information to get through. It's taken me ages to compile all this, um, so apologies for there is a ton of information to get through. So there's one point actually here we can sort of uh, cover without really beginning, and that's um, this point about the fact that data speeds are measured in bits per second. So BPS. Um, is bits per second that's probably the only bit you need to know anyway uh, we sort of covered this in a previous video i think it was on uh, data storage and compression and we had to do we had to rearrange an equation uh, to do this so we've kind of covered it already and there's not really much more we can add uh, but what we can do is start this topic by defining what a computer network is so we say that we say they are connections between nodes and a node in this context is just a device attached to the network and the whole idea is that data can be exchanged so people connect to networks in order to communicate over large distances, share resources like printers, collaborate on projects and access remote files like a company database. And obviously all of these involve data being exchanged. Um, and so what, the first thing we need to look at is classifying networks in terms of a geographical scale. So this is in terms of how large they are uh, physically. Uh, so at the smaller end we have local area networks or LANs. And these are networks that connect computers that are close to each other physically. So they're literally close to each other. Uh, you know, it's not in terms of anything more complicated than that. So it's difficult to define. There's not a set definition for what a LAN is. But we tend to say, you know, a network in a house or a school could be defined as a LAN. And it is kind of subjective a little bit. But a wider network, a larger network, is a wide area network or a WAN. And this is spread over a broader area. And if a larger scale we have the internet which is a worldwide network for focus of the next topic and uh, the, the internet is a network of networks and so this means that a WAN can be made up of individual LANs. And another one to look at is personal area network, a PAN as you might say, and this is a network based around one person. So the local area network isn't necessarily based around one person, it could be based around a school or a household, but based around one person and often this is actually given a definition of 10 meters, although how tight how uh, stringent that needs to be is debatable but um, for example uh, you might have your own laptop that's connected to a phone maybe with Bluetooth and a printer or wirelessly and this would be in this personal area network a slightly trickier one and slightly different is a virtual private network or a VPN and this is a private network that's been extended across a public ne network so the perception is when you use a VPN it acts as if you're in this private network although it's connected across this public network. So if we look at, if we look at this diagram, this is of maybe uh, one of the uses of a VPN might be for a company. So a company might have its own network in based around head office, its own this private network, no, you know, people can't just connect to it. And so if they connect through a VPN using certain protocols, they can connect if they're roaming or if they're in other offices and it basically connects across this public network, so the internet is a public network, but it acts, it behaves as if you're in the private network wherever it's actually based. And so one reason to do this, people can buy VPNs, um, I've used VPNs before for the bottom reason to uh, circumvent geo blockers, so like to watch American Netflix I would connect to a VPN, a private network based in America, and it acts as if I'm in America even though I'm in England. And another reason, and it's kind of not really what a VPN does, because it's because you're spanning over this global network or this public network, people can still see your traffic. Although usually VPNs use encryption, so that when it does cross um, this public place, this public network, uh, the data can't be seen or read. Um, but this isn't happening by default. Um, but the, um, the VPN's location. It's quite important that using a VPN, it acts as if you're at the VPN's location. Addressing is quite an important concept in networking, and so just a bit of background for a device to actually be able to connect to a network, it needs something called a network interface card. This has got a couple of names. Um, it might be you might know it as a network adapter or a wireless adapter. It's a wireless one, and basically it's just a circuit board that bridges the gap between your computer and the network. So it might. Uh, change some signals coming from your computer in order to work across the network. And this is what it might look like. They're usually built into your computer. You might also have like a USB one that plugs in. Um, this is obviously more of a wireless one, and this is just a uh, wired with Ethernet. And all of these have a unique identifier called a MAC address, Media Access Control. And this is manufactured into them. So there's probably going to be a, some ROM. Um, this could be ROM on either of them and well both of them will have this unique identifier manufactured into them so the MAC address on this 
network interface card will be different to the one on this one. And so this in theory means that every device on a network or in the world has its own MAC address and it's meant to be unique worldwide. I've no idea how they actually do this. Presumably there's some sort of uh, organizing body that just provides a set of MAC addresses to each manufacturer and they just have to be, I guess, trusted to make them unique each time. Um, and basically the idea is that because this is actually coded into the hardware, um, if this actual ROM probably has this MAC address stored in it, it cannot be changed by us. You know, you can't just change a MAC address on your network interface card, there's no reason to anyway. Whereas an IP address, which we'll look at in the next video, can be changed. So this is what a typical MAC address light might look like. Uh, they're six bytes long each. Um, this is expressed in, hex uh, in hexadecimal, because we'd have 48 bits otherwise. Uh, this is, um, remember that each hex digit is representing four bits, hence why we have six bytes here. Um, and so the front bit of this, I mean maybe this is something you don't need to know, the front bit is a manufacturer code and the end is the unique device code. So I assume when I say the organizing body, they sort of hand out this bit to the manufacturers and then the manufacturers handle the rest of it. And there are obviously enough combinations that it can be unique worldwide. So the main use of MAC addresses is on local area networks, not across the internet. So MAC addresses aren't used to send data across the internet because the address gives no indication of where the device is. Because uh, as we'll kind of look at, IP addresses kind of tell you where they are based in the world and so it can tell the routers where to send the packets. Uh, don't worry if you don't understand what that is, we'll look at it, we're going to cover it uh, in the next video. But um, these, you know, um, a uh, Chinese manufacturer could send this device to America, they could send it to Russia. Uh, this offers no indication of where the device is actually situated, so they're only really useful on LANs and we'll maybe talk about one case where they're useful a bit later when we talk about topologies. Um, so addresses like MAC and IP addresses are needed to locate the nodes uniquely because both are unique um, and uh, this means they can then communicate. And one thing the uh, uh, specification says is to know about host names and a host name is just a string of characters that uniquely identifies a computer. So a host, um, another bit of sort of uh, terminology, a host is just a computer connected to a network. And a domain name, which we're going to cover in the next video, is what actually refers to the network. So we might have this address, and my school would be what we call the domain name, and the host would be my laptop. So this would, if we just did myschool.org, it would connect to the network, or if it's a website, it'd probably just connect to the host server automatically, even though we haven't got the www in front of it. But this connects to the actual uh, host named my laptop. So this is um, a way you can connect to an individual device rather than the network. To fully understand this topic you really need to try and understand how important protocols are. So really important. And this is because in order to make a network work reliably you need to establish certain rules of communication. Uh, there are so many different manufacturers of hardware devices from all different countries and all potentially with different methods of transmission. They work in slightly different ways. And so there need to be accepted standards of transmission and these are what protocols are. So the definition of protocols, multiple, is uh, the sets of rules for communication between connected machines. And so this is kind of like um, when, so uh, a bit of a bad example, but when uh, loads of politicians from different countries meet, they have to agree on certain languages. So in the European Union, they might speak English, whether they're from Germany, uh, France, uh, wherever, they might speak English to have a common language between them. And this is kind of what a protocol is like. And you also need to know about packets, which are uh, completely related to protocols. So a packet is a small amount of data sent over a network. So when something is transmitted, so when some data is being sent, it's broken down into individual packets. So each, so some bits of the data will get packed will get packaged into a packet um, and it's kind of split up like that and then at the final destination when it arrives at the receiver these individual packets are reassembled to get the total data this is how you can maybe visualize it we're going to break this down in the next video a bit more but we'll have some additional information and the data being sent it must be part of the data um, there'll be loads of packets that have been combined to send to uh, to find the whole data that's been sent if that makes sense so a bit um not something you maybe need to understand too much because it's slightly beyond GCSE, but we tend to um, express protocols in terms of layers. And this is based on a model called an OSI model. And each layer is responsible for a different part of the communication process. And the internet uses a suite, a group of protocols called the Internet Protocol Suite. 
and the name we the, the name that's most commonly used this is another name for it but TCP IP is how you'll probably see it expressed in your exam and so this is the two most important protocols but it has these four distinct layers you can see I've changed a couple of labels here but I wanted to show you this diagram because you can see we have different layers do different things you can probably guess by the names what they do but um, we each of these are protocols I don't know what all of them do they might do really specific purposes I know most of them some of them you might recognize we're looking at HTTP DNS in the next video and IP2 um, so there's diff loads of different protocols in this suite and the internet uses this and most networks have kind of adopted it too as the internet has become so crucial um, so yeah it's become the accepted standard for data transmission so what it does this total protocol suite uh, handles the structure routing and, and reassembly of the packet so it's directly relevant to this definition up here and the two core protocols for ones that have been deemed important enough to be in the name TCP which stands for transmission control protocol and the job of this and without going into too much detail it's really complicated um, I don't understand every detail about it. it basically just the end result is it provides reliable and ordered transfer of data between the connected devices and the other one, Internet Protocol, again uh, complicated but maybe slightly easier to understand. Uh, this just specifies the structure of the packets and defines the addressing. As I said, we need to elaborate on packets a bit more. So uh, one method of transferring data is this method we've talked about, this is packet switching. And so as you can assume, this uses the packets. Um, and TCP IP, the Internet Protocol Suite, uses this method. And the reason I'm talking about this is that the specification says something about having to you have to be aware that there's more than one method of actually transferring data um, and the other method really is circuit switching and you probably don't need to know too much about this hence why I've only done it on a single line but um, in packet switching um, no fixed path is created between the devices communicating which means for packets well first of all packets are used so circuit switching doesn't use packets and each packet could take a different route to get to the destination so you can basically go the fastest route on a network that's really busy uh, the fastest route may be constantly changing and so this makes it more efficient where circuit switching just a single route a single circuit between the two devices is established and just for data sent as a steady stream and I guess by nature this means that this circuit being used these wires or whatever medium is being used is kind of out of bounds for any other devices trying to communicate on the network so this is what tends to be used and this is what the internet uses packet switching but circuit switching is used um, like uh, telephones so like landline phones where two phones connect along a telephone line um, whereas like a mobile phone would use packet switching two mobile phones calling each other um, just to talk about the packet structure a little bit more just to sort of link into the next bit. Um, this is the diagram we showed before. This is uh, the same basically. The, the actual labels, header, body, and trailer do vary. Um, like this is called data, so body could be with data instead. Also payload sometimes. Footer is sometimes used to the trailer. It doesn't really matter. Um, so the header is one bit of the additional information. So it's, it's the information about the data being transported in the packet and so this will contain the packet number uh, what packet it is in the sequence so this helps it you know to be reassembled so this is the tenth packet this is the thousandth packet in this sequence of data uh, also it will contain uh, details about the addresses used so maybe the MAC, the MAC and IP address of the sender and receiver and this will help devices known as routers which will be covered in the next video actually send the data forward the packets on to the destination and also it will contain details about what protocol is being used and the body is what contains the actual data being sent and finally the trailer is it contains other information usually information about error correction and it may contain something called a checksum which is what we're looking at now that's my uh, link into the next bit so um, the idea is um, why we would use a checksum is that communication channels aren't always that reliable uh, this is I guess partly obvious to us you know the internet doesn't always work routers go down hardware doesn't always work with the internet but generally um, most of it's hidden from us because uh, of you know different communication channels have uh, different interference and uh, data can be uh, lost and so errors can be introduced during transmission um, and one way to detect an error is to use something called a checksum algorithm this has got a couple of names um, like hashing algorithms sometimes but really the idea of a checksum is it adds to, it adds together the values of all the data being held in the packet and transmits this value as part of the packet so in this trailer and the checksum is this sum of all the uh, data values and how this is done is obviously done by the algorithm like you can think if 
So say um, the packet contains just uh, numbers, it could just add up the numbers and the total would be the checksum, but obviously data isn't always sent like that and it's sent in binary, so the algorithm will determine how this is done, it's quite complicated. Um, and so this checksum is sent with the packet in the trailer. And so when the packet is received by the receiving device, it can then repeat this process so it can add up the sum of the body as well and compare it to this checksum sent with the packet. And if it's different, then it knows that there's been an error introduced and it can be resent. A lot, a lot of algorithms to do with uh, transmission and protocols to do with data networks and transmission uh, result in data being retransmitted. So one, one thing a protocol does is when um, a device received a, receives a packet from a sending device, it will send back a confirmation. And if it doesn't send back a confirmation or it sends back uh, something saying that it's been an error, it just resends the packet. And so this may happen a lot more than we realize. Another way uh, to detect an error in transmission is to use something called a parity bit. And this is again added to the end of the transmission or added as part of the packet. And as we know, data is sent as a series of zeros and ones in binary. And one way to, uh, well, the way your parity bit works is it basically counts the number of ones before and after uh, to determine whether the data has been changed. So it, it counts it before it's sent, and then the receiving device will count it up again, count the number of ones in this transmission, and then it can live check some compare to see if it's been changed. And there's two uh, types of parity, I guess type is probably for words you'd say. Um, and the first one is even parity. And so this is a method using a parity bit, which means um, the number of ones are counted like normal, but if there is an odd number of ones, then the parity bit is set to one, which makes the number of ones even, so it kind of tips it over the edge. Whereas if there is an even number of ones, the parity bit will be zero. So an even parity, if this is being used, um, it wants the number of ones in the transmission to be even, hence the name. And so if there isn't an even number of ones, um, it will make it even by adding another one as the parity bit. Otherwise, it will just leave it as zero because it's happy with it being an even number. You can also have odd parity. Uh, I believe even parity is used more. Um, but odd parity is the same method but opposite. So it also uses a parity bit. Um, and uh, again, it counts the number of ones. And if there is an even number of ones, the parity bit is set to one, which makes the number of ones odd. So it now wants them to be odd. And if there's an, e if there's an odd number of ones, the parity bit will be zero, just to leave it at how it is. And so again, when the data is received, the number of ones will be counted up again and compared against the parity bit, depending on which one you're using. Um, and then if it's wrong, it can be resent. So here um, we can see we've got uh, an e so zero is an even number technically and we have an even number of ones here because there's no ones and so we're happy with that with even parity we leave it as a zero so this will be transmitted along with this in the packet potentially um, so it could you could visualize it just being added onto the end or before it doesn't really matter usually it's written separately and then if it's an odd if we're using odd parity instead and this will be specified in any questions we, we want it to now be odd with with an even number of ones at the moment so we add a one to the end of this to make it odd in total and um it applies to all of these pause the video see if you can understand what's going on and uh, once you understand this uh, you'll just get it um if you're struggling to work out what's going on pause the video and read this again because uh, me repeating it probably isn't that helpful Okay, if all this information wasn't enough for you, um, you need to know about three types of network media. So this is just for transmission channels that uh, data is sent across. The first two I know very little about. They're not massively relevant to computer science, but they're useful to know about, I suppose. So the first one is a copper cable. And uh, a cable is two or more wires running parallel in one assembly, which enable the transfer of signals from one device to another. Sounds to me like a Wikipedia definition. I'm pretty sure I just read the uh, copper cable Wikipedia page because not something I know too much about but uh, one thing I could talk about is that copper copper is used because it has this high electrical, electrical conductivity so property of copper is it transports charge very well not as well as some devices like gold is a very good uh, conductor but obviously gold is expensive so gold is only used in small amounts in electronic devices you wouldn't want a whole cable made out of gold unless you were very rich um, and like to waste money so copper is used instead and it's sent down, uh, the data is transmitted down these cables through electrical signals. This is something called a coaxial cable. 
um, I believe it's pronounced. You also have um, twisted cables. I don't think these are twisted cables, but uh, I guess one of the issues with copper is uh, electromagnetic um, forces can affect them. Um, but yeah, I don't know how much more you'd need to know really. Uh, another cable that's, um, I suppose, so I guess copper is used um, in people's houses, it's used. I think so. Fiber optic is a relatively new technology, I suppose. Um, you see adverts where uh, telecommunications companies are saying they're rolling them out. So, fiber optic cable uses pulses of light in a transparent core, so usually it's glass or plastic, and it's obviously thin and flexible, uh, but it transmits data. So, it transmits data in the form of pulses of light. And it's kept in the fiber because it undergoes something called total internal reflection. Possibly something you've learned about in physics, depending on what course you're doing at GCSE. Um, but yeah, basically you have something called a cladding and a core. And the core is surrounded by a layer of cladding. The cladding has a lower refractive index because you need the critical angle to be um, above 90, I believe. But anyway, that's not really relevant. Uh, but like I said, um, fiber optic cable is sort of used as more like a backbone. So a fiber optic cable might be used across like a town or maybe a city. Um, but then copper will be used for sort of individual connections going to houses and between houses and so on because fiber optic cable is more expensive but it's a lot faster than copper cable although you know copper cable isn't slow uh, the electrons aren't moving slowly in the cable uh, and the third one is wireless um, so networks can be established wirelessly through radio waves so radio waves are the main way there are other ways but in terms of things like wi-fi use radio uh, use radio waves and wi-fi is actually a standard and it's called a wireless local area network, or a WLAN, or WLAN, I have no idea how you meant to pronounce that. Uh, but but Wi-Fi is really just a standardized wireless transmission with radio waves, so standard frequency is used for Wi-Fi. And something called a wireless access point, this is the hard of actually broadcast this radio signal, which the devices can detect and join using a wireless adapter. Okay, the final thing we have to talk about in this video is another classification of networks, and this is in terms of their physical arrangement. Not in terms of their size, but in terms of how the devices are arranged, how the nodes are arranged. And this is something called the topology. So topology means the arrangement of the nodes and connections in the network. And the first topology, first of four we need to cover, is the bus topology. And, uh, let's get that a bit too fast. So this is how a bus uh, a, a network in a bus topology might look like. So in this topology all the clients, servers and resources like printers here and oh, I thought it might be a fax, fax machine or something but um, uh, all these resources are connected to one medium and this is a bus. We talked about address bus and data bus buses in the CPU video. Same kind of idea obviously a much larger scale. Um, so when a node communicates this data, the data is sent down the bus uh, which all the devices receive but only the intended recipient accepts and processes the message. So um, say this workstation was trying to communicate with this workstation, we transmit the data and it goes all the way down and it basically keep reflecting um, if the terminators weren't there to stop it, keep sort of reverberating up and down. And so every, de every device receives this message but only the one um, will, only one it's intended to will process this. And the way it can work out that it's intended for it is using MAC addresses. So the MAC address in the packet could tell this workstation that um, it's the one that's meant to receive a message from this one. That is one uh, use of a MAC address. Uh, another topology that uses a different arrangement is a ring topology. And this, uh, the, the way we show you on diagrams isn't necessarily how they look in real life. So it's not necessarily a circle, but it's more that it's connected each device is connected to two other devices forming a ring although it's not literally a circle and the, me the ring is where the messages travel around so instead of going up and down or being stopped by the terminator um, this goes round in a circle yeah. and uh, so the nodes take turns sending the data so they won't send data at the same time there's a protocol that uh, prevents this from happening and so when a message is sent it's sent in one direction and is received by each device until the intended recipient receives it um, and then it will stop um, being transmitted so uh, again could be using MAC addresses or even a, a local IP address. A third topology we need to look at is the star topology and as you can uh, well maybe yes this is this looks a bit like this and so the idea is um, most home networks use this um, because you have this central connection point and this could be a router which is something we'll cover in the next video or an access point, a wireless access point if we're doing a WLAN um, 
and a hub, a hub and a switch are two similar things, but we don't need to cover them for this course, so I'm not going to explain it too much. Uh, so each each node is linked to the central connection point, and um, if we talk about maybe advantages and disadvantages, I haven't included them because I didn't want to extend the video longer than it needs to be. But if you just, you just have to think about the practicalities of this. So if this let's say this is a router, if this router broke, um, there would be no transmission between these workstations. Whereas if it if it was in a, a uh, bus topology, if this workstation broke, it wouldn't affect transmission of all the other ones. Um, whereas a star topology, and not only have to buy this quite relatively expensive bit of hardware, um, if it breaks, the whole sort of network is compromised. Um, so finally, the one, the last one we need to look at is the mesh topology, and so uh, this looks a bit like uh, this. So in in it, we can talk about mesh topology in terms of a true sense and um, a, a more practical sense. So in the ideal sense, every node is connected to every other node in the network. I assume that's what's happening here. So every every node is connected to all the other nodes. Yeah, it looks like it. Um, although in a more practical sense, because this would be very expensive and maybe not always necessary, there are just many connections. You know, it's not a single connection. Um, this workstation is only connected to this hub or switch. You know, there's many connections between the nodes. And so a full mesh, a full mesh, which is what I'm saying by the true sense, so every node is connected to every other node. Um, it might be used to provide a bit of a backup mechanism because if one connection fails, then it can still communicate with that device just via a longer route. Basically, uh, it can still communicate um, because, as I say, all devices can be still be accessed, albeit not immediately directly. And um, just to reiterate my point about it might not literally look like this. It's not going to look like a nice star. Or well, this is called a star, but anyway, um, it might look a bit more like this. So you can see we have many connections between this node is connected uh, to four other nodes. Um, but this, is, this obviously wouldn't be a full mesh because not all of them are connected to all of them. Um, but this might be a more practical representation if each circle is representing a node. Uh, so that's it for this video. Hopefully it was useful. Um, another large topic coming up next. Next, and that's about uh, the internet and the web.